NBA 2K Mobile, guys. Definitely check that out, man. You know, as Knicks fans, uh, we have very limited great moments but we know all of our great moments man from the 94 finals the 99 cinderella run linsanity mellow brunson taking the team to the second round well in nba 2k mobile you have the opportunity to create your own memories man it's a great game if you guys haven't checked it out go into your app store whether you're android or, or apple and download nba 2k mobile there's a lot of great features in this game one of them is the tournament mode and one of the biggest features of nba 2k mobile is that they reward you for everything with player cards and once you get the player cards you can essentially create your own fantasy team so when i opened up the app the first five player cards i got was obviously jason tatum he's the cover athlete i got dejounte murray i got uh karis levert uh collins and i got nurkic so it's a decent team but as you go up as you level up in nba 2k mobile when you win games when you accomplish different objectives finish different drills you'll get your your coins you'll get your your points so you can level up and get more player cards you can get nba legends bird jordan magic so on and so forth and create your own fantasy team to create your own memories with man so it's a great game definitely check it out very sleek interface the graphics are on point and a lot of you guys are, are on your phones 24 7 anyway so you might as well tap in to the best basketball franchise and that is nba 2k mobile download nba 2k mobile for free on the app store or google play and use my promo code tatum 2k mobile that's tatum 2k mobile to redeem an exclusive jason tatum pearl tier card but the Knicks made a little bit of noise yesterday by re-signing Josh Hart to a, uh, a four-year, $81 million extension, bringing the entire deal, his deal with the Knicks, to uh, five years, 94. Well, what do you think about the Knicks uh, bringing Hart back and at that number? I, I love it if he continues to, you know, shoot as well as he did this past season with the Knicks. Uh, like, granted, he's not going to shoot over 50% from three again, but you hope he's nowhere close to the, you know, 30% from three he was with Portland where he wasn't even taking open shots at certain points th throughout the season. So I think with Josh Hart, like, he's just a perfect fit. Uh, I, the, the rebounding from his position, the screening off ball, the activity, the cutting, he has that kind of connective, you know, the connective qualities that help, you know, an offense run in the half court. Never mind, like, how good he can be on defense as a versatile player. With Josh Hart, I mean, he's also, like, just a high-character guy for the locker room, too. He's just, like, a good dude. Um, he makes a lot of sense to have to build around this next season. But the big, the big thing, really, is the jumper, though. You know, he shoots 50% during the season, and it drops down to closer 30. to 30% during yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. Who is he actually as a shooter? Is he always going to be inconsistent? Uh, what actually happened last season? Uh, or is he just always going to be that guy? That That's my questions with Josh Hart. Yeah, I, just, I, I expect for it to come back down. I mean, he shot over 50% when he joined the Knicks on two attempts. It's kind of hard to, to maintain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the transitional stuff, attacking and transition, the defense, that's all going to be there. Uh, just his grittiness for a Tom Thibodeau-led team. We know we're going to get that. But like as you said, KOC, if like he can get that jumper to fall, that would be that would be key. My question is like for him, like, or not necessarily for him, but for the team, is that he the way I look at it now is like he and RJ, like what fans want to see RJ do, he's do he can do that. So I'm wondering, like, what does this mean for RJ when it comes down to crunch time? You know, he got the extension last year. So my thoughts are like, what's happening for RJ in the future? I mean, with RJ. Like I think with him is he we're talking about consistency with Josh Hart is RJ also going to be one of those guys who's always up and down where he's you know crushing for what seven eight straight games during the play playoffs and then he goes one for ten in game six game six and, yep. and like yep. you know and and that's the type of thing with RJ it's always been like that for him going back to college and like the highs are amazing the lows are really frustrating where you just want to trade him and and move on to somebody else and maybe that's what ends up happening but with rj i i hope he finds some level of consistency like you want you want that steadiness each game you don't want the highs and then like serious lows you want highs and then like a, uh, it regulates back to norm highs and then back to normal but like when it's high then low high then low like that that's where it's really tough when you have a one for ten in a must win game so with rj i i think maybe maybe like that uh I think it can work. I think it can work. I, I just 
wish he wasn't, you know, didn't have as much demand on him as he seems to have to have. Yeah. Where were you on him? Go ahead. Where were you on him for, for your draft? I, I can't remember what you had for him for your draft guide. How'd you feel about him coming into the league? I think I had him third. Maybe, maybe third? I think I had him third that year. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll have to pull it up, but I believe I had him third that year and I liked him. I mean, I felt, I feel pretty much the same way about RJ now. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had him on my board at number two. So I had him two uh, that year and, you know, I had a Jaws on the stake, uh, but I was betting on which Knicks fans still are six, seven size and hard work. And like that, that being able to manifest into consistency, the consistency hasn't happened, but his weaknesses are still very much the same now as they were then. He's just a better version of himself. So can he find consistency? I don't know. Like he has yet to prove it over, yeah. over the course of time. And he may just be one of those guys who's always up and down, but I still like RJ. I, I think even the RJ skeptics they're there, you have to look at what he can be defensively um, and feel good about that. And if he's somebody, if he is a guy who's always going to be inconsistent, at least, you know, there's going to be certain nights you get like a great performance out of him. And like it's almost the same thing with him that it is with Josh Hart in the sense that like he a couple of years ago he's shooting forty percent from three, and now he's tumbled back down. Is that something with his mechanics? Was that a fluky season? Was that an outlier? Is there something his trainer Drew Hanlon is going to be able to work out with him over the course of time? I personally think just RJ is who he is, and he's always going to be this guy. And to me, he's the number one trade trade piece on the Knicks and he's the guy I'd be shopping around more than anything else. I wouldn't want to pay him like $30 million a year. That that's, that's kind of the way I feel with RJ at this point. I've soured. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know what the future holds for RJ, man. I mean, obviously we saw two years ago within the, uh, the Mitchell off season when they were putting him out there to get Donovan Mitchell. I, I don't see this regime being so, you know, closely tied on him. They didn't draft him. And so if they have a chance, obviously, to get a player like a Mitchell or maybe MB comes about, I think they, they won't hesitate to, to put RJ in the deal. I'm still questioning the fit with he and Julius Randle. You know, you have two guys that really need the ball to, to be as effective as they can. And especially, you know, the inefficiencies shooting in that starting five. When you have RJ, you have Julius, then you have a Mitchell Robinson who's not really going to be shooting it from the outside I think ultimately they're going to have to make a move to shake up that starting five to try to get some more fluidity in the offense and more consistent shooting. I agree with you completely. I mean, like the, it, it worked last season to an extent. I mean, we saw some of the upside with the team, but they need more shooting. They need more consistency and all the key guys you're listing. (laughs) They don't have that consistency (laughs) for, for this reason or that reason, or it's Julius Randall going from dominating to moping uh, or guys making shots to, you know, going ice cold. It's a lot of inconsistency on the Knicks and you need, you need that stability to become a championship team. And and fortunately the Knicks do have the pieces. Like they have a, you know, bunch of future first, they have their own, they have some young talent that they can put into deals. And they were patient this year, kind of waiting for that opportunity. It seems like, so uh, I think for the Knicks, they, they, they got better with their, you know, addition with Dante DiVincenzo and you hope the young guys get better, but ultimately it's going to have to be a trade that, you know, propels them from, Oh yeah, really good team. That's, you know, in the playoff race too. Oh, they're actually contending for a championship. And, and that that's what you want to be, not just a playoff team. What did you think about, you know, their offense finished third in, in the East during the regular season? But a lot of that was you had Runson and Randall killing in isolation. They were turnover. They were mistake-free. They, they, they were careful with the ball. They got a lot of second-chance opportunities, a lot of offensive rebounds and, and putbacks and things of that nature. But in the playoffs, especially in the Miami series, it seems like all of those advantages are almost nullified. You know, their offensive rebounding edge, uh, being able to take care of the ball, you know, just making several mistakes against a very stingy and aggressive heat defense. But then, you know, it was, again, more isolation and, and not really having enough shooters to bail you out or trusting your shooters so what did you think about that that shift from how they played in the regular season to the playoffs i mean i wonder if they need to start building some of those better habits over the course of the full regular season um you know i think there were time like you said the knicks offense was great it was it was a great offense for the regular season but there were moments that the offense gets stagnant 
And, you know, I was looking up earlier their isolation numbers on second spectrum and like they had 25.1 isolations per game, which is the fourth most of any team over the past six seasons. The 1920 Rockets, James Harden, ISO ball Rockets had 38 in 1920. The 1819 Rockets had 32 per game. The 2122 Raptors had 26 per game. And the 2223 Knicks had 25.1, fourth most over the past six seasons, kind of this kind of contemporary era. And granted, they were super efficient at it. They were one of the most efficient teams of all of those teams over the six seasons. But, I mean, I just wonder if maybe sometimes the downfall of that comes in playoff moments where they they could get a little stagnant at times. Um, I think with, you know, Jalen Brunson, he is unbelievable in isolation he is unbelievable in pick and roll and anytime you're running pick and roll and sometimes the defense switches it does force you into those isos it is a tool you need to have but you know maybe with you know some of the guys that they have like these high iq players who know how to move without the ball heart and grimes or quickly like these guys like that i wonder if that's kind of the the evolution of their offense that they need to have in the playoffs sometimes where it's like how can we get these guys who are so smart into motion more often um, then you can toggle between movement in the half court and cutting and screening off ball like Hart loves to do and then go right into your iso and that versatility is maybe what could you know help things carry over from the season into the playoffs yeah i, I mean it, it has to because especially when you look at some of your your contenders, the teams that finish in that final four, the final two, the champions, a lot of the times, you know, teams vary from year to year in terms of their style of play, but a lot of the times you see a couple of common factors. Number one, their effective field goal percentage is usually top 10, right? Highly efficient, whether it's high percentage shots or from three. But number two, they move the ball very well. Their passing numbers always up there. You look at Miami, Denver, they're right up there. Passing the ball, moving the ball, assists, assist percentage. With the Knicks, even though their offense finished in third, every year under Tibbs, they're always in that bottom third quadrant in, in that category. They just don't move it enough. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think that's that's gonna be the key thing is finding that right balance. Cause you know you can ISO at any moment. You know you can. So like how can you how can you maximize some of the other players on this team? Because like it's not like it's not like they have a weak supporting cast. They have a, a lot of talent with their supporting cast. Like even like Quentin Grimes, granted, uh, like he yeah, he had like the playoff moment against Jimmy Butler on defense, but his playoff performance on offense wasn't quite the same as it was during the regular season. And I mean, if he can never mind if he can tap into some of the stuff he did towards the end of the season with some of his high scoring games, but like, if, like him continuing to improve some of these young guys, I just think there's a lot of talent on this Knicks team that could be maximized in, in an offense where it's more movement, more motion, but maybe that's completely unrealistic to expect from Tom Thibodeau. KOC, you're, you're preaching my language. You're, you're speaking my language, man, because this is what I've asked for this entire CP knows. I've been complaining about this for, for like kingdom come this past season where it's like, I want to see more movement, whether it's grinds quickly. I mean, even with OB top and when he was on this team, I'm like, it's not being utilized right, man. I mean, why is he, why was he relegated to be the next Steve Novak on this team? Just <laughs> spotting up from corner three, instead of, you know, getting out in motion. Why weren't we using Isaiah Hartenstein in, in like for more movement for like with our bigs and just using him as a facilitator. I mean, I think that's just kind of the product of a Tom Thibodeau team where it's just been so heavy isolation. You just see a lot of that from the guards. I mean, I can go back to thinking about when the Chicago Bulls had Nate Robinson, right? You don't have a Derrick Rose that year, but Nate Robinson playing against the Brooklyn Nets. And I'm just watching Nate pound the ball into the like <laughs> into dirt, essentially, just holding on to the rock. And I'm like, you know, it helped. But it's like this is not the way for like a successful team and. You know, just to get guys like you said, Grimes, all those guys involved, man, just need more ball movement. You know, every single night, I'd be like, oh, look, we got up to 25 assists. That's pretty good for this team. And then it just created right back down into the teens. And I'm like, where are we going? But I got I got to shout out this nugget because I think it's I think it's pretty funny. I said this to you, CP, through Twitter. Uh, KLC, KLC, I don't know if you saw this. Uh, shout out to Caitlin Cooper, who does a phenomenal job covering the Pacers. She sent out a tweet uh, yesterday. She said, shocked that I'm not shocked by the statistical nugget. Julius Randle used more possessions in isolation last season, 417, than the entire Pacers, 412. That should give you an, an idea of how much isolation this team runs just through Randle. I, I don't even want to know what Brunson's numbers are because I'm sure it's also up there too. Wow. So Randle had more than the entire, the entire Pacers, Pacers team? 
Yes. What? <laughs> that is wild. It's insane. It's gr- I mean, that says everything you really got to know, right? And I, I look, Randall, I have never been a big Randall fan. Um, going back to Kentucky, I just think his defense is so weak and he gets lost so much off ball and uh, I, I, I just, the, you know, even when, even when he's good, sometimes I'm like, how good, how long are you actually going to be good defensively? And granted, he's you know better last season after the bad year, but you know, and even better last year than he was during his first All NBA season. Like th- when Randall's great, he's great. However, I, I, I do wish in that slot there could be a guy who just you know inspires more of that movement you're talking about, Alex. And, um, you know, again, like maybe that's too much to expect, but the guys they bring in, the guys they draft, they signed Dante DiVincenzo to a big contract yeah. who just had his best season with the Warriors, best season in, with, in the NBA with the Warriors after he made himself a first round pick with Villanova, who used all these types of motion concepts we're talking about. And I, I just think the guys they're bringing in seem to indicate from the front office side of things, this is what we want and what we desire to do. And it's it is weird though. Like we're talking about the Knicks, like as if they had some crappy offense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. But it, it's like, but it's like the playoffs are just what matter so much more. Like yes, they had this amazing regular season offense. How much does it matter when it went in the toilet during the playoffs? Right. I mean, that, that's all that ultimately matters. It doesn't matter if it's a 10, 11 game sample. They were not good in the playoffs, and that's what matters. So once again, we're talking to Kevin O'Connor, who covers the NBA for The Ringer and FanDuel TV, man. So to everybody in the chat, hit that like button, hit that thumbs up button for you boys, and share this video. Uh, Kevin, on DiVincenzo, as you said, had a, had a great year with the Warriors. How, how do you see him sliding in and, and fitting in with this Knicks team? I think he's a nice addition. It's like a solid salary number that they got him at. Um, you know, if he's if he's continues to shoot the ball well as he did with the Warriors last year, with his ability to not just I, like be a spot up shooter, but he's the type of guy who can run a secondary pick and roll for you. He can create some opportunities for Brunson off ball as well. Uh, he can attack from the weak side of, at a closeout. So I think with Devin Genjo, Devin Genjo, that that's the type of thing with him that. Um, he should fit into this offense, especially as we're talking about the potential evolution of it. Uh, so I do like the signing. It makes a lot of sense. And it was a area of need today. And it's a type of thing that, as we were talking about earlier, could make a Barrett a little bit more expendable. Uh, it could make it quickly. Somebody like that, if a trade opportunity comes up where you have this kind of, you know, stable of good, solid wings that maybe you end up trading one of those guys and don't feel like you're losing a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that, especially with now you have more glut in, in the guard rotation. So whether it's starting, you know, middle of the rotation or closing games, Tibbs is going to have his work cut out for him. But I still agree that this was the right move to make. He was kind of the best of what they could do with, with the mid-level, in my opinion. And so they went out there and got it. Josh Hart made the sacrifice for him to get it. But there's still one more big piece that that they need. To me, this team is still capped as a second-round team. I don't see them as a legitimate Eastern Conference final team. Sure, if they go on a run, some teams do that. But I don't see them as a legitimate contender. A lot of people have their eyes on Philadelphia what does your gut tell you between what's going on with the Harden situation and ultimately what happens with Embiid? I mean, with, with that, that's what could end up determining what happens with Joel Embiid. With, with if James Harden gets moved for the proper return and allows this kind of reshaping Sixers roster to accelerate, you know, or, or step up what they're trying to become as a championship team, like with Joel Embiid. As amazing as he was last season, the same thing happened in the playoffs where efficiency dips in the playoffs. It's almost the same conversation that we just had with the Knicks, this kind of stagnant, slower paced half court offense and beads efficiency dips. How do you get him to get better in the playoffs like we just saw with Nikola Jokic and the Nuggets? How, how do you elevate his play like we saw with Giannis and the Bucks a couple of years ago? Mm-hmm. So for the Sixers, I, I've always been a Harden guy. I've always liked James Harden, and he's been pivotal th- this past year and a half with that pick and roll with Joel Embiid. It's been one of the league's best pick and rolls, but mm-hmm. in the playoffs, it just gets stagnant and doesn't work. So if I'm the Sixers, I'm looking for the best return with the Clippers or whoever some mystery team might be for him. Um, but like the tough part is like Daryl Morey, like you can't 
you can't take a deal that makes you worse though you can't take a deal that you know you feel like hinders your chances of winning a championship because that's what could lead Joel Embiid in a year to say you know what I want to go somewhere else or in two years to say that like however long it might be one year two years a year two years two and a half years if Joel Embiid gets to the point that he says I want out of Philadelphia then it's all over like Daryl Moore, you've lost your job. The whole front office lost their jobs. The team's rebuilding, and Embiid's in a new place, contending for a championship. So every move needs to be about that. And like for James Harden, man, like that, like I just don't think there's a lot of interest out there. I, I have yet yeah, to hear of a team that that other than the Clippers that even cares to entertain trade talks for him. But maybe there is a mystery team out there that we don't know about. So you don't think that? So well, I guess I got two questions for you. I'm going to start off with this one uh kev so for harden right like you don't i guess what would have to entice another team to like take his his contract on and and like you see the value in him at this point because he is he is declining right he's not the most athletic guy that we've seen over the years he's been a guy who's able to draw fouls um finish through contact but the league is changing where they're not making those type of calls anymore. So like if you're a team outside of the Clippers, right. And, and think about pairing him with Kawhi or PG, like what other team is out there that's looking for someone like a James Harden on that contract. I, I think it's a team that is desperate and willing to take a swing on somebody who may or may not have a chip on their shoulder now. And, being a prove it year because he didn't get the money he anticipated from Philadelphia or anybody else this offseason. He that's why he opted into the player, the player option that he had, because he realized the market out there w- was insignificant for him. So if he can kind of pull a Chris Paul the year he goes to Oklahoma City and you know changes the way people around the league portrayed him as somebody who still had years left, it's not like Harden like sucks. <laughs> I mean, he's still a, yeah. like a really good player. He's still one of the 20, 25, or you maybe you want to say 30 best players in the league. He's still a really good player. Um, he's just not the top 10 guy that he was before. So I, I think for teams, maybe if you feel like you can get him on good value and then increase that value even more, whether it's a player that you decide to keep, like let's just say, you know, Minnesota, somebody like that, you know, where they're kind of, you know, playing with a Damian Lillard idea if they were to get desperate and go for a Harden or Somebody like if Miami doesn't get Dame, but would Philly want to trade within their own conference and help out the Heat? I can't imagine that. Yeah, I just don't think there's a lot of teams that make any sense for James Harden with where they are today. Like it doesn't make sense for these playoff bubble teams in the West. Like the maybe Minnesota it does, but it doesn't for OKC. It doesn't for New Orleans. It definitely doesn't for Dallas. It doesn't for Utah. Doesn't for Portland, like they just drafted Scoot Henderson and they already have Damian Lillard who they're trying to trade. Houston doesn't want him. San Antonio, it makes zero sense. Like go up and down the league. There's so few teams that you can even argue Knicks make that no makes sense. sense for him. Yeah, Knicks make no sense. None. Not all like None. Brunson Harden together. That would I mean, we're talking about there's too much isolation. Like yeah. can you imagine if they added James Harden to, to Julius? I jump Randall? off a cliff, man. I jump <laughs> off a cliff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it would be horrible to watch that. Oh my god. And I don't know. Maybe maybe like a desperate Orlando team or or Chicago feeling like they're stuck in the middle. Uh Miami if, if they don't get Damian Lillard. But other than that, I I, I just don't think, think there's many teams for him at this point, and that's sad to say because he's still good. Um, but I wonder with Harden, maybe there's still – like he he's become more of a playmaker and become more of a passer, as as you said, Alex. like He just doesn't have the burst anymore. He's not drawing fouls like he used to be. Maybe this is the year he's like, okay, I'm going to tap into more of my Oklahoma City version of myself where I'm like coming off of screens and cutting to the basket, and I'm doubtful. I'm very yeah. doubtful of that, but – he has evolved, so maybe he'll continue to. And that's what could make him more appealing to a bunch of teams around the league and not just, you know, a handful or just one, as we're talking about now. Now, my second question for you is are you concerned like would should Daryl Morey be concerned that if he goes into the season with James Harden after what he's caused the season? I've been asking everyone this question, and I want to know your thoughts on this, Kevin. If you go into this season with James Harden, already wanting out 
And don't aren't you worried about the locker room? Aren't you worried about team chemistry and, and how are you going to move forward for that? Like, are we even sure that James Harden is going to be playing at his best? I mean, we saw what we did in what he did in Houston. What gives Maury any confidence that Harden's going to come in here, play his best in order to work up his trade value just to get moved? I'm sure Daryl Morey has 0% confidence that James Harden will go into yeah. Philadelphia and do his best to improve his value. Um, it might actually be the opposite, that he has full confidence that Harden will do everything that he can to force his way out of Philadelphia. Um, I, I, it's a very difficult position for the Sixers. Uh, and I, I don't I don't envy the, the spot Daryl Morey's in right now where he's got you know a guy that he has had a long relationship with and now it's you know tarnished completely maybe being together and having some time and in late september when training camp rolls around could help mend that um but from my understanding is that relationship is toast right now i know others have reported on that as well uh i think for philadelphia like that the clippers seem to be the only team right now but you don't want to take a bad deal you, you can't take a bad deal you're, you're better off just not taking a deal at all rather than that you're better off waiting than taking a bad deal today that was the similar mindset that he had with ben simmons yeah with simmons you know it was like hey you're just gonna get rid of this guy you gotta get rid of him well no he waited and he got james harden and harden then it was a lot higher a higher level of a player than he is perceived as today and despite all the downsides they and bead harden still was one of the league's best pick and roll duos in the league, we still saw Harden have some monster playoff performances just a couple months ago. It worked to an extent, just not to the level of winning a championship. He made the right bet waiting, and I think he'll make the right bet waiting just now, right now, just like I think the the Portland Trailblazers would with Damian Lillard. You got to wait for the best possible return in the right moment, and right now it seems like only the Clippers are actually in on James Harden, and it seems like. Only the Miami Heat are in on Damian yeah. Lillard. And if you only have one team who wants your player, you're not going to get the best return. Yeah. There's no incentive for that team to offer it. So I think for both those teams, they got to wait and drag this out, kind of the similar to the Nets game plan with Kevin Durant. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly, man. They, I think both are going to have to wait and both are going to have to try to engage other teams, man, because as it stands, a one-to-one -one trade is just not going to get them what they need. Uh, once again, we're talking to Kevin O'Connor from The Ringer, man. So to everybody in the chat, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Uh, let's get to the phones. We got area code 469. What's your name? Where are you calling in from? This is Mike White. Michael White. What's good? How you feeling? Man, I'm mad. Man, what are you mad about, I man? Tell me what you mad, bro. Out. I, I think they're pushing IQ out. Uh, he doesn't have the minutes. He's not, How can he get the minutes if he's not getting one minute? One minute are 38 with, uh, with uh, Jalen, and then DiVincenzo is not here to, to for 10 minutes. Then they signed both of him and Hart for, you know, uh, 50 million, or in Hart's case, uh, what 80 million? Yeah, I, man, I I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I thought that was poor. I think that's poorly done, and it's obvious that they're going to trade him before the before the trade deadline. Okay, so Michael White is saying they are squeezing. Appreciate the call. They are squeezing IQ out of it. Well, look, he's still going to be a, your backup point guard, right? He's still going to be a backup point. I think where it comes down to you know determine whether or not his minutes are going to get cut is closing time he's been a fan favorite of Tibbs as a closer because his two-way play his defense off ball he's been tenacious on the ball you need that that lightning rod and and Tibbs has gone to him as a closer for the last two years now logging probably I think the most fourth quarter minutes of all Knicks players so now obviously Brunson is a stalwart where you go at the five you never know Brunson and Julius will be there but it's a two and the three. Those are going to be the biggest question marks. Are you going to go with IQ? Are you going to go with Grimes? Are you going to go with DiVincenzo? Are you going to go with Hart? You literally have four options for two spots in crunch time. And depending on how players play throughout the game, every night, every loss. I was saying this the other day, Kev. After every loss, fans are going to be questioning, well, why didn't you go with this guy at the two and the three? Every single loss, you could put that in the bank, man. Now, Kev, I know you. I know you had some words about uh, IQ 
during this past season. Knicks fans got on you for apparently not hyping him up as you should. So now this is your floor and your chance <laughs> to do so. <laughs> when I say I think he's not a, a, a build, me and Verno said not a building block or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. I forget the way we reframed it. Uh, like IQ is a, is a good piece. <laughs> that, that's the way I feel about IQ. I voted him for as six man of the year. Uh, I I really like quickly, but I think for the Knicks, it's I don't think it's as much they're pushing him out as much as they are making him more expendable for the right deal that brings in the type yeah. of deal that you need to make to become a championship team because quickly is really good and really young, and another team might perceive him as somebody with significant upside, and maybe it will end up being the Knicks that he reaches that upside with. Maybe he is the guy that you end up keeping and it's other players or other picks that you end up moving in a deal. But I think by bringing in DiVincenzo, having Josh Hart and Quentin Grimes and all these other guys, you know, RJ Barrett to me, like it's a, like the, the, when the Knicks make that deal, whenever it happens, it's RJ Barrett or quickly. The other team is going to say, hey, we want that guy in this yeah. deal. We need that guy in this deal. We want to build with that player. And the fact you have all these other pieces makes that decision a lot easier to make from the Knicks side of things. It's, it's a, I think it's a good problem to have uh, for New York. For sure. And I think the other thing, too, is just like competition, right? You're going to have competition in training camp because when you look at DiVincenzo, Grimes, IQ, RJ, Hart, all of their all their minutes are not guaranteed. So those guys are going to have to earn every single ounce. And that's what, through training camp on a nightly basis. So it's also good just to have competition too. And not like for up and coming players, in my opinion, to make sure that they truly earn and see like how, like the difficulty in keeping your job in the NBA, because I think some players just take it for granted that they can obviously win it. And this will hold on to it forever, but that's not just the case for every single player and for every single team. Yeah, look, I I think uh, I agree with you guys. Um, teams want good players. If you want to get a good play, you got to pay to play. IQ's been the Knicks, one of the Knicks' best two-way players since he's gotten here. He's only gotten better, finished second in the league in six-man of the year voting. But as you look at the contracts that they're doling out, he is is going to be commanding northwards of $20 million a year. And as they get up close to those luxury tax aprons, the first and the second, by re-signing all these guys, and in, in two years, you're going to have to give Brunson double what he's making because he's on a tremendous discount here. We'll see if they even bring Julius back. But as they get closer and closer to that apron with a second round cap team, if the, if there's no more major upgrades here, sure, Dolan will spend the money, but will it be worth it for a team of that caliber? So I think ultimately Leon and, and these guys are going to have to, you know, come to a crossroads and figure out who's going to be in, who's not. Everybody, every kid is not going to make it here. Obi, we saw that with Obi Top in this past offseason. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But IQ's role with this team is still very important. And we'll just have to see what, what, the, uh, what the future holds. Uh, let me get to the Discord. Dan from New Jersey. Dan, how you feeling, bro? Okay, okay, okay. How you feeling, bro? I want to talk about the heart signing, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, let's go, man. Uh, I love Josh Hart. I'm not exactly sure what this means in terms of how we're going to come up with the money to pay quick and grimes. I know the cap has gone up and we're going to have the space. My guess is we're going to have a couple guys locked in, and some of them are going to need to go when it's time to do that trade for you-know-who. I'm not going to say any names because I don't, don't want to jinx it, but y'all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> But listen, man, I think yeah. Hart is a really solid piece and he's somebody I would like to keep if we were to do that trade. I think he's I, I think he's a dog, man. I think we got a whole lot better with him on the squad. And, you know, he was locking down that three towards the end of the season. Not at you know, he didn't he he's not a high volume shooter, and that's never gonna be a sustainable part of his repertoire. But if he shoots it with confidence, man, he could knock some of those he could knock some of those shots. And so good signing by the office. I think it's good that they secured him. And you know, go Knicks. Uh, also, Trey Young is a crybaby. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Dan from New Jersey, man, always with a good call. Shout out to Dan. Yeah, Trey's all over the airways. I should have been on the USA team. You know, these guys can't stop talking about three years ago when he embarrassed the Knicks. 
Yeah, him yeah. and Arenas, man. Good ward. Yeah. Talk about being desperate for attention. Uh, why, are you, no. why are you worried about beating Alfred Payton and Reggie Bullock as a backcourt yeah, with Frank, Frank Nolakina? Frank. Come on, man. You guys took out the Sixers. Go talk about that playoff. <laughs> that playoff series. <laughs> right. Can't, 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 can't make it up here, Kev. Can't make it up. I'm, I'm just I'm just basking in this. Yeah. <laughs> Trey yes. tra, tra Young fans, uh, they hate me more than more than anybody else right now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be Russell Westbrook uh, stands yeah. who used to hate me. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, rem- I remember that. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what. I was right about Russ. Uh, I'm right about Trey Young. I was right about Russ to evolve, and I'm going to be right about Trey Young, too. He's never going to anything. <laughs> Atlanta fans tuning in right now. Hawks fans are down treacherously, man. They're down bad, man. 